Hello, this is Live Among Ghosts, Crafting Technology from Feminist Materials. This talk will be an overview of an art project we created and the theories that arose through making it. We call ourselves Haunts. It's a collective of four women from Ontario, Canada, Julia Gingrich, Kathleen McLeod, Rekha Ramachandran, and myself, Kara Stone. Live Among Ghosts is an interactive installation piece created from a disassembled laptop computer, recrafted and molded. We took an old broken laptop that we ripped apart into its smallest pieces, spray painted, created molds, wove and sewed soft materials, and hung it from the ceiling. Now the operator will take the core holder and pass the needle through the core, around to the other side, and then weave it back through. Here we have a pair of girls who are wiring the address wiring of the core of mud. Now they pass the wire back and forth, stored in the needle and put it through the cores in a particular wiring. The empty screen frames hang on either side, one of the computer and one crafted. They act as proximity sensors, so two people at either side can control different tracks, consisting of machinery sounds, recordings of Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage's analytical engine, sewing machines, looms at work, women's chatting voices while weaving, with the sound of women's belabored breathing throughout. This project was funded by Refig, Refiguring Feminism in Games, an organization based out of Toronto, Canada. The main issues we are dealing with are the duality of craft and technology, the masculinization of technology, the Anthropocene and materiality, and the restrictive nature of the divisions of art and media. The handmade and the digital are often positioned as polar opposites, especially within art communities and institutions. In these maker spaces, it is seen as something fundamentally different about the ways of creating. One of the differences is the gendering of methods of crafting. Crafting in the handmade is seen as feminine, whereas technology is dominantly masculine. Although this is a common dichotomy, women in crafting have had an intrinsically linked history with computer and digital technologies. Sadie Plant's book, Zeros and Ones, Digital Women and the New Technoculture, revisits women's part in creating and using technologies. Plant tracks Ada Lovelace, a woman who is often described as the world's first computer programmer. In designing the analytical engine with Charles Babbage, a mechanical computer with punching cards, she related the way the machine worked to weaving on a loom. Beyond Lovelace, women have had an integral role in working with and the creation of technology. Film editing has a very similar association with crafting. Early in cinema, editors were groups of women who cut and taped the film strips together. It was seen as a process similar to sewing. Digital pixelation has the same properties as cross-stitching, as each square is a solid color that connects with other solid squares to make a whole. Plant argues that women have had an immense role in digital and computer creation. When computers were vast systems of transistors and valves which needed to be coaxed into action, it was women who turned them on. They have not made some trifling contribution to an otherwise man-made tale. When computers became the miniaturized circuits of silicon chips, it was women who assembled them. Theirs is not a subsidiary role which needs to be rescued for posterity, a small supplement whose inclusion would set the existing record straight. When computers were virtually real machines, women wrote the software on which they ran. And when computer was term applied to flesh and blood workers, the bodies which composed them were female. Yet with all this history, computer technology has become considered masculine and dominated by men. Our project, Live Among Ghosts, aims to reunite technology and crafting. It explores the history of women in technology while not solely locating their influence in the past, offering recognition of the work women are currently doing, such as the women in low-pay factory jobs, wrapping thin wires in a specific pattern, 
bonding hair-thin wires to semiconductor chips, packaging, literally making phones, computers, consoles with their hands. It is important to recognize the currentness of crafting and technology. Crafting, too, is not a relic of the past or a sign of nostalgia. Anne Svekovich, an affect theorist, warns about this. And lest crafting seem pervaded by nostalgia for the past, it is important to note that it belongs to new queer cultures and disability cultures that, along with animal studies, are inventing different ways of being more in the body and less in the head. This project is less to do with nostalgia, um, actually it has nothing to do with the nostalgia really, but rather rethinking and reforming our past into something women have had agency in and continue to have agency in. Plant writes, if she hasn't had a hand in anything, her fingerprints are everywhere. And in a literal sense too, when we were opening up iPods and CD players and this computer, we found little notes and check marks and traces of the human on sleek, lifeless pieces of metal and plastic. Seeing those reinforced the handmade crafted aspect of technology. Robots aren't just spitting out fully formed technological devices. Svekovich argues that the art form of crafting is especially effective due to the sensory experience of touching, rhythm, and repetition that reunites body and mind. Crafting is about a way of being in the world that requires not just knowledge, but practice. So in the project, we took up the combination of technology and crafting in a very literal sense. The bulk of the project consisting of crafting the pieces, so there was some digital work in sourcing and designing the musical tracks and programming the sensors. But the circuitry that connected the sensors to the Arduino, the board that controls the piece, was more akin to crafting, using conductive thread and tying it around objects in specific ways. One of the most effective experiences of creating this was when we were deconstructing the pieces of technology. Sometimes we used tiny jeweler's tools, but a lot of the time we used our hands to rip it apart using so much force, so much more than we're supposed to use with our delicate and sensitive personal devices. It was quite cathartic to destroy these devices that have been so masculinized and have caused criticism and grief and judgment. There are things that often women are warned not to use too much of, to not understand the inner workings of, and especially not demonstrate that we know how they work. As a group, we predominantly worked separately, but got together about once a month to show each other what we've been working on, discuss themes and feelings that have come up, share materials, see how things look together. Our first meeting, we just talked about the themes of the project, of the combination and similarities and differences of technology and craft. We took notes and softly brainstormed, no fully made blueprints, but rather space for experimentation. The next few weeks, we deconstructed tech and melded the pieces with traditional crafting and saw what organically came up. In the next meetings, we would have show and tell and pass objects around in a circle to be touched and inspected and ooed over. We each have a different process and aesthetic, and though at the beginning we may have been cautious that it wouldn't come together to a cohesive project, the differences between us point to the many different hands that mark each created object, technological or craft. Negotiating the relationship between labor and play was the most difficult part of creating Live Among Ghosts. Having funding for this project from a video game studies organization changes how the piece developed. Feeling more pressure to be gamey or to respond to video game theory or current practices rather than doing what is best for our idea per se. Of course, we tried not to get consumed by that, otherwise it might not be an honest expression, but it was still present. As other scholars on games for change or serious games have written about, it is extremely difficult to find a balance between labor and play. Too playful and the meaning is thrown out the window. Too much like work and no one is engaged enough to play with it. Of the four of us, I, Kara, was the only person to have designed video games before and really consider myself part of that culture, though Ramachandran and Gingrich have collaborated with me on other game projects and all of us have done experimental video and installation work, as well as craft work. Interestingly, I was the most resistant to the interactive portion of Live Among Ghosts and the most worried about the pressure to be gamey. I would frequently question the point of the dual proximity sensors, and I was actually worried that they would take away from the beauty of the objects, which is a whole interesting belief that I'm still working through. But the other members of Haunts were for it, 
and spoke about how it adds the significance of hands and the labor done by hands and the fingerprints left on our little robots. The proximity sensors control the sounds which grow louder the closer your hands hover. In no way would Live Among Ghosts fit any Game Scholar's definition of a game. There's no winning, no losing, no narrative, no unfolding of new experiences, no meaningful choice, though games and crafting actually have a lot in common. They are often experienced through delicate, specific hand gestures. Gameplay is an embodied activity, an extremely embodied activity compared to other modes of consumption of art media. Every single video game relies on body to technology, physical touching, or gestural movement. I move to expand out the definitions of game to physical interaction with technology with an element of playfulness. Art media without technological interaction can be playful, but the viewer is not necessarily playing with it. Keeping the proximity sensors brings forth experimentation, improvisation, and engagement that make up playfulness. This playfulness does add a connection between the player and the piece, adding to the experience and, for lack of a better word, thesis. Though very simple, it is extremely engaging and each of us when playtesting would be pulled in and consumed, feeling amazed at the control, as if there is a kinetic energy between ourselves, the controller, and the sounds. Moving of hands hovering rather than clicking and pressing buttons, not actually touching the objects, brings forth a ghostly, haunting feeling, recognizing that something is there but it's ephemeral, close but too far, immaterial yet not at all. The more we worked with the physical objects, the more we realized the importance of materiality and the dismissal of the material in this digital age. The more we worked with the physical objects, the more we realized the importance of materiality and the dismissal of the material in this digital age. Yet another divide between craft and digital media is the belief that one is purely physical and one is purely digital, but that's false. All digital media exists in physical space, on hard drives, in waves in our air. Though computers look sleek and uninviting, futuristic, or space-aged, they are literally made from the Earth. Jesse Perica, who retitles the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene, for how obscene this age is, writes, The Anthropocene is a way to demonstrate that geology does not refer exclusively to the ground under our feet. It is constitutive of social and technological relations, as well as environmental and ecological realities. The amount of materials that make up our devices is incredible. He writes, Media materiality is very metallic. 36% of all tin, 25% of cobalt, 15% of palladium, 15% of silver, 9% of gold, 2% of copper, and 1% aluminum goes annually to media technology. We have shifted from being a society that until mid 20th century was based on a very restricted list of materials, wood, brick, iron, copper, gold, silver, and a few plastics, to one in which a computer chip is composed of 60 different elements. Discarded technology is an incredibly fast growing concern. Many of us cycle through computers and phones every three to six years, trashing our old tech that has no chance of decomposition back into the earth to replenish the vast amount we pull up from the ground. And the materials are mined from across the world and shipped across the world many times over. iPhones are geological extracts, drawing across the globe earth resources and supported by a multiplicity of infrastructure. The bits of earth you carry around are not restricted to small samples of Africa, but include material from the red dog put mine in Alaska, which are then refined into indium in Trail, Canada. This quote does not mention the labor scattered across the globe, again, the young women crafting these earthly elements into gray machines we see in stores. In what Donna Haraway calls the capitalocene, the relationship between capitalism and the Anthropocene, the earth becomes viewed as a resource, one we are running out of. Many artists dealing with environmentalism and the Anthropocene are using recycled material and sustainable practices. As much as it's great to recycle a piece of dead technology into an art piece, it's not really the answer to the issues, but it works to point out that there is an issue that needs to be solved in creative, forward-thinking, and diverse ways. Seeing the material guts of a computer suspended from the ceiling gives the feeling that these are fragments of an ancient culture that burned itself out, that there are material fragments left over from previous histories. 
While in the process of creating, we often commented on how the molds of computer chips looked like something created by ancient aliens. There are so many aspects of environmentalist activism that need to be taken up by the general population. Deterring food waste, conserving water, eliminating chemical waste, recycling plastic, and obviously so much more. But the ways we use and consume technology need to be a part of that conversation. We created Live Among Ghosts in hope to interrogate the common dichotomies of craft and technology, masculine and feminine, future and past, material and immaterial, and inspire others to blur the boundaries.